Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap, presented by Full Press Coverage. Check out fullpresscoverage.com for this and other great podcasts and articles. You can also find our podcast anywhere podcasts are found. Find us on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, wherever the YouTube version you may already be watching. But in case you're not, it is youtube.com slash Jet Stryer, my name. J-E-T-S-T-R-I-A-R, and you'll get the treated to the beautiful visual spectrum of myself and John Sapacchetti. So without further ado, let's get into the show. And we're actually going to start with a little bit of a serious topic. Uh, typically, we try to stay away from politics or being too serious on the show, even though, Sap, you and I have both covered the news and are into politics, but this is supposed to be mainly a basketball podcast, but occasionally those worlds intersect. And when you're talking about the biggest star athlete on the planet in LeBron James, anything he does makes news. And he was reacting as pretty much everybody was earlier in the week uh, to the verdict in the George Floyd murder case. And then that same day, there was a, another shooting of a, uh, of a young black woman, uh, kid really she was 16 uh mckee i want mckee bryant is her name Mm -hmm. i believe i'm pronouncing that right mckee bryant uh lebron tweeted and then deleted a uh a picture of the of the police officer who fatally shot uh miss bryant saying your next hashtag accountability with an hourglass emoji uh again he later deleted that tweet and then offered a couple of apologies or not really apologies but explanations so before i get into those sap uh did you see the tweet as it went up or were you were you were you kind of reacting after the whole aftermath reacting afterwards because that particular occurrence happened the about a half hour before the George Floyd verdict was going to be read in Minneapolis. And this happened in Columbus. Uh, Officer Nicholas Reardon was called uh, to a a pretty serious situation. And a 16-year-old girl, Makaya Bryant, as you said, was wielding a knife, um, went after another young girl, and the officer ended up shooting her four times. She was pronounced dead uh, on arrival at the area hospital. So it, it was just so crazy that it was happening at the same time. And the news came out that once again, a white police officer is shot a black person. Now, every case is different. Obviously um, in terms of George Floyd, there was no shooting, but we all saw the video from a year ago, nine and a half minutes of Derek Chauvin, the officer with his knee to the throat of George Floyd. And it's still one of the most horrific nine and a half minutes that I can remember and Maya, really anybody's lifetime. So we were all on board that they had to find Derek Chauvin guilty. I'm sure there were people on the right who didn't think he should have been found guilty. But I even talked with some police officers, uh, Jet, and they said, well, Tucker Carlson, Jerry <laughs> Callahan, you know, the usual suspect, right? <laughs> but I talked to police officers and they said he's just screwed it up. He screwed it up for all of us. Yeah, because I think now a lot we're of them all are- painted. We're all Very painted angry the same thing. Exactly. So it, and, and I talked to them. They said, no, he got what he deserved. This other case is a little bit different. Now, you know, in in my heart, I think that shooting someone should be the last resort, but I'm not in the position of what the police officer was in. Uh, She was wielding a knife. You know, if if she if the officer was able to tase her, that would be the best way to handle it. Maybe he wasn't. Uh, Can you shoot to injure rather than shoot to kill? We don't know that because we've never been in that situation. Hopefully we'll never be in that situation. And quite frankly, most police officers have never been in that situation. That's probably the first time that Officer Reardon faced that. So, Uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, it's just something that doesn't happen. I mean, uh, if it happens once in your career, oftentimes it never happens a second time, because quite frankly, after that, you may not be able to be a police officer anymore. Not that you're going to be suspended, because I, I don't think what he did was outside the realm of the way he was trained. But, you know, how was he going to sleep at night knowing that that's what transpired? So, um, you know, to doubt that police officer, I really can't go there. Uh, Again, could he shot her, you know, in the arm where the knife was? Uh, Could he be shot her in the leg, taser? I don't know. I honestly don't. I'm I'm not an expert to speak about that. So, but back to LeBron James, and and he tweeted that out. And and I think LeBron was just so fired up. like a lot of African-Americans, he saw that the verdict came down 
and Derek Chauvin's going to spend a long time behind bars. He'll be sentenced in about two months. That when you saw this, and the news reports weren't really thorough on this, it was just basically white police officer shoots black girl. Well, when you hear that, you're like, not again. But every situation is different. And then LeBron did take it down, really never apologized. And now he's hearing from the usual suspects, Tucker Carlson, Jerry Callahan, everybody on the right, police forces throughout the country, you know, want him reprimanded. As you said, Jet, when someone is that well known as LeBron James is the biggest athlete in the world, one of the biggest people in the world, he's got 50 million Twitter followers, he's got 80 million followers on Instagram. I mean, when he speaks or tweets, people listen. Yeah, he's one of the most uh, famous people on the planet. Without, without question. And, and he's very comfortable going into these things. And he's also pretty good at, at waiting a moment, taking a deep breath, and then going into them with some knowledge. In this case, I think he may have jumped the gun. So, you know, he's going to have some pushback against him. I mean, they're talking about that the league should fine or suspend them. That ain't going to happen. No, they um, won't do that. Uh, th- not the league's all. given the players, you know, uh, this long, uh, right, long rope or leash or whatever you want to call it with their their social media. They can basically, as long as it's not just completely out of control, they can they can weigh in however they want, you know, politically. Sure. They're, I mean, if it's homophobic, there's going to be a problem. With yeah, that, that's it should be. But this yeah. is more a reaction to there's still uh, so much social injustice in this country, and this was a reaction. Now again. He, 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 he was a bit early on this, but as I've said many times yet, the greatness of Twitter is that it's instant and it's raw. The not so great thing about Twitter is it's instant and it's raw, you know? So uh, I, I can attest back to the marathon bombing eight years ago, 20 minutes after that happened, the New York post tweeted out that 20 people were dead and two Saudi nationals were captured. None of that was true, but because news agencies want to be the first, not necessarily the most accurate, Stuff comes out right away that's not even right. accurate. You know, in my day, and again, I'm going to be 58 years old uh, pretty soon here. And, you know, but you had to have sources. You had to have, you know, checks, balances. And then you could put forth a story, which would come out in print the next day. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. Everything's instant. And everybody wants to be first uh, and right, but first, more importantly than right. And that's where we're at right now. So what does everyone do? They react to what they hear first. And unfortunately for LeBron, I think he he kind of overreached a little bit. Yeah, you're certainly right that that's the mentality is, is first. In this case with LeBron and something you, you said, Sap, when you, when you started talking is that, you know, all these cases are – you don't want to see them ever happen. You don't want to see an officer <laughs> kill somebody if, if they don't have to, especially a young kid, uh, which she, she was. Miss Bryant was 16. I mean, that's far too young to be shot <laughs> and killed. Um, but they're not all made the same. And she clearly had a weapon, a knife, and was clearly motioning to stab, uh, who the, the girl that was also on the car. If you've seen the video, Mm -hmm. uh, which I wouldn't recommend watching because no one should have to watch anybody die. Um, so this isn't the same situation as George Floyd or um, a lot of these other cases that, that you've, you've been seeing in the news recently. Uh, it, it certainly had, you have to take some nuance into it. I agree mm-hmm. with you, Sap, in that I, I do think shooting your service weapon, especially shooting to kill, should be the absolute last resort. And it is certainly possible, and I'd say maybe even likely, that this officer did save the girl who's going to get stabbed mm-hmm. with life. Uh, potentially however uh i do feel like there is this and this is a training thing i don't think that officer went into it and said black girl i'm gonna kill her no i think no eric chauvin saw black guy i'm gonna tip put my knee on his i think there was uh, not think i know there was racist intent behind what happened with george floyd i don't know that there was racist intent here so much as poor training uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that the, that the department and that's why I hate the whole term defund the police, because I think it's a losing term. And really, the term should be re- retrain the police. Exactly. Something like that. The, the training just doesn't seem to be effective at all. It, there's no community trust with the police. No. Or it's eroding rapidly. And, and I think a lot of that is because the people that they a lot of people they hire to be police officers are underqualified. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the training is suboptimal uh, in, in a lot of ways in that it doesn't talk about de-escalation nearly enough. 
Um, and I think that the, the standard for using your service weapon is way too low uh, as far as the training dictates for a lot of these officers, as opposed to there are really good non-lethal options available. And there's just not a lot of emphasis placed on that. And again, I'm not a police officer. I can't, I don't want to be a police officer. Their job is incredibly difficult. Uh, and, and a lot of situations, it's, you are dealing with life and death. Um, but, and to make that decision in a split second is, 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 is tricky, but that's why there needs to be more training. And that's why there needs to be mm-hmm. people who are qualified to do it as opposed to the right now, I think you've, you've tweeted this out before, Seth, it's harder to become a barber than a police officer in terms of mm-hmm. the amount of hours you need to log in a particular school or training. That just shouldn't be the case. Anytime you're handling a deadly weapon, you should have far more training than a barber. Uh, that, that's just insane. So, so back to the LeBron thing now that I've sort of gotten that out in, out into the air. A lot of people were reading LeBron's tweet as your next with the hourglass as a threat in terms mm-hmm. of like this person died because of you. You're next to die. I don't believe that's what he meant. I no. think that I don't know that a lot of people believe that's what he meant. But that's now the messaging from a lot of people who don't like LeBron James or are on the conservative side of things is that he was threatening this police officer with bodily harm. Uh, Not LeBron saying, I'm going to come and kill you, but saying, you know, mobilizing the community, more or less. I -hmm. don't believe that was the intent behind it. I think it was clearly we just got Shelvin in prison. You're the next police officer to go in prison. However... The ambiguity of the tweet, and then, again, we'll get into this in a second, his subsequent tweets, didn't really weigh into that. It didn't explain fully what he meant. I feel 99.999% sure he was saying, you're next to go to prison. But there's Mm -hmm. enough wiggle room there for people to create their own narrative. This is the Rashomon theory, right, where, you know, you see it one way, I see it another way, and probably somewhere in between is the truth. Uh, You know, there's a a great episode of All in the Family, and I know this is an old man reference, but it is one of the greatest shows in the history of TV, where a black repairman comes into Archie Bunker's house to fix the refrigerator. Archie, who was very conservative, saw the black man as threatening. Mike, his son-in-law, who was very liberal, saw Archie threatening the black serviceman. And Edith, who wasn't really political, saw the way it was, that he was just a basic guy coming in to fix the refrigerator. So that's what you see now. I looked at it as, yes, that now we're going to prosecute this particular officer. I don't think it was threatening. Your next implies something just happened before that, and that was putting Derek Chauvin away, not causing a massacre of Derek Chauvin or getting violent with Derek Chauvin because he's going to be in jail for a long period of time. That's the message LeBron put out there. But again, if you don't like LeBron, and there are a lot of people that don't like LeBron, he is a lightning rod, he's a polarizing guy. Um, if you don't like him, you're going to say, well, he's threatening police officers right now. And I always find it kind of funny or sad that people on the right who talk about people on the left of being snowflakes, the people on the right are just as much of snowflakes as people on the left, if not more, because they're the ones that are supposed to be tough, you know, put on your boots and strap up your boots and, you know, get things done. And then they sometimes could be as big a pussies as anybody else. So yeah, I I didn't find it threatening, but again, I'm I'm a LeBron guy. But I also, you know, try to logically look at it and say, you're next. Accountability, the emoji of the hourglass is now you're on the clock. You're going to be prosecuted, brought to trial and put away. Now, I don't think this officer is going to be charged because he seems to be more so in the right than in the wrong. And again, this is where you have to bring nuance into this. Not every case is the same. And that's where it gets dangerous. If, if you all of a sudden have protests are great but if they turn into riots based on what happened in columbus then now you will become the boy who cried wolf and you have to pick your spots with stuff like this like it should have happened and it did in in minnesota uh you know during the chauvin trial where we saw kim potter an officer 28 years on the force mistaking her taser for her gun and again I talked with some of these same police officers. The taser is a different color than your handgun, and it's much lighter. There's no way in hell you should ever confuse the two. 
I know I would not want to get on a plane and have my pilot say, did I drop the gear or not as we're about to land? Well, let's see what happens. You know, maybe I, those I, wheels aren't down. The wheels up. Yeah, that it is. It's hard to believe that. And I was talking to my dad about this the other day, and he made a good point, too. There's really no reason for the taser to even be shaped like a gun. It, right. Yeah. It, why not have it why? as a stick? Yeah, it, exactly. Or, or a stick or it used to be like a. Like almost like a remote control. Like why? Why do yeah. they have it shaped like a? Why even allow for the possibility of confusion? One will kill you. One yep. will subdue you. <laughs> That's a great like, point. Yeah. So I I don't know. Uh, yeah, but do you agree, Seth, that that LeBron? And you can't. It's hard to fault somebody, especially you and I, can't get be in the shoes of a of a black person in this country, mm-hmm. um, for reacting. You know, and and, and all these emotions are flooding out, but. You know, he is such a high profile person that he left too much ambiguity in this tweet to allow for people to say, yeah, oh, you're threatening a police officer. You don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't think any real rational person is believing that's what he's saying, that LeBron is is dumb enough to uh, say, I'm going to something bad is going to happen to you. We're going to cause you bodily harm. Uh, I, I mean, I just don't believe that. But. You know, he when you are that high profile, you have to think about every little thing you make. So it was a it was a bad tweet. It was a bad was. tweet. And um, I also think there's a couple of things that you can look into, Jet. First of all, he has 50 million followers. Should he have someone handling his social media? And I think in some sense he maybe does. But in certain senses, you can tell he doesn't. It's raw. When he tweets out, it is raw. It is instant. So. That's what makes him appealing, because I do think he really is concerned with these things. If you have someone handling it for you, by the time it gets into their hands, it gets sanitized and it loses its effect. I mean, Twitter is instantaneous. So maybe he needs someone who's there with him and certainly can afford it, who says, LeBron, let's not send that tweet out. Let's let's shape it a little bit differently. But you know what? We had a president for four years who governed through Twitter. And had no filter either. And the people on the right love that about him. The other thing, too, with LeBron right now, he's not playing. I think he, like Kevin Durant, who's constantly on Twitter, maybe has a little bit too much idle time at this point. Now, LeBron's more, you know, interested and invested in other things besides basketball. He's got his media company. uh, You know, he's got a movie coming out in a couple months. He's he keeps himself active. We're Durant. He's got kids, a wife. Yeah, he's got a lot of stuff going on. So. Even though he's not playing, I think he's still active with stuff. But with Durant, who's fighting everybody on Twitter, you know, I think after he goes to it, they don't even have practice anymore. You know, days in between games, he's going back to his house and just sitting around and decides to, you know, go at people on Twitter. LeBron does have more going on, but maybe once he gets back to playing, he won't have as much time, you know, to 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 be, you know, consuming so much news. I want him to consume news because I think he's interested in it. And I think he's learning to try to find out more and more of the details. But again, I think the the country was at that point, because it it happened, the the shooting happened a half hour before the verdict was read. As soon as the verdict was read, we heard about, you won't believe what happened in Columbus. A white police officer killed a black woman. Now the details come out and we can see, okay, that police officer is not going to be prosecuted because really what else was he supposed to do? The one that still, you know, troubles me more than anything is Kim Potter shooting Deontay Wright with what she thought was her taser. That to me is just like, I can't even understand that because either you're stupid if you confuse the two or you're lying, you know, neither one of those is good. I think your dad has a, a great idea. You know, why does the taser even look like a gun? And one more point, don't and give again, them. The, don't give them that out. Don't give them that possibility of saying uh, I was you, confused. You're right. Yeah. Have a, a. It's a different color. Have it as a different object. It doesn't have to look like a gun. The other thing too is I, the same police officers I was talking to, because I like to talk to them and, and get their feelings on these things. Because as they said, you know, Derek Chauvin's ruining it for all of us. Everybody thinks we're all the same as him, and we're not. In Massachusetts, they do a much better job of training the police officers. We don't see this very often in this state. You know, I mean, I know we had an episode 30 years ago with D. Brown where, you know, he was brought to the sidewalk as a potential bank robber because he kind of fit the description of another black man. That was horrific. That didn't look good. But I think the police officers in the state are better trained. They're better paid. So I think you're getting better people working those jobs. Now, there's plenty of corrupt cops in Massachusetts, especially within the state police. But I think better trained, you know, will lead you to better results. That goes without saying. 
because a lot of the things that these states are doing now in reaction to what's happened, our state's been doing for years. So I, I think that that's an important part of it. Local and state have to really get more involved and do a better job of training these officers. Yeah, again, that's why I think the defund the police is just a losing message because it's idiotic. There's never going to be an elimination of police. It's just it's Nor never, should there never be. ever no. going to happen. Uh, no. But there could be a significant retraining of police and, and absolutely reimagining of what the qualifications are yes. and the standards are to meet to become a, a, a police officer. Right now, the bar is far too low. That doesn't mean that everybody who's a cop that they, they just waltzed in and they became a cop. No, but there's the percentage is too high. There should be a zero percentage of unqualified police officers. Yep. You're carrying a weapon that can kill people. You're you're enforcing the law. You can't be bad at that job you have to be good at it you have to be qualified you have to be good at it there's no room for error that's why even if you believe kim potter and she made the mistake that's unacceptable you can't make that mistake you need to be prosecuted for it you don't chalk it up to oh everybody makes mistakes you killed somebody because you made a mistake that to me is a mistake worthy of going to prison over period without question without question have a you have a gun you're entrusted with people's lives and safety. You are not allowed to make a mistake at that point in time that results in somebody dying, especially somebody who's unarmed. Again, gradations, right? This Micaiah Bryant story, Sap, is different than Derek than the Derek Shelvin and George Floyd story, which is different from the Kim Potter story. Mm-hmm. You have to, you can't look at them all as the same thing. You have to look at them different. I'm not saying that. This officer, Nicholas Reardon, was in the right or that he was in the wrong one way or the other. But it's I know in my heart, it's not this same thing as what happened with George Floyd. It's no, not, not even close. I'm not excusing it. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I it's not the same thing. So no. you need to look at it. It should, it should it shouldn't happen because the training should be different. There should be other ways to do it. But I, I don't believe the intent was was anywhere near the same as what we saw on that nine and a half minute video that you said sap with Derek Chauvin. So uh, let, let me get into LeBron's subsequent tweets uh, and we'll react mm-hmm. to that before we, we move on. Uh, so after LeBron took down that uh, account, your next accountability tweet, uh, because I mean, you could see in the comments, it was getting very, very heated. Uh, he, he fired off two tweets afterwards. Uh, maybe that's not the right term. He wrote two tweets afterwards Anger, in all caps, uh, he wrote anger and then resumed to normal. Does any of us, does not do any of us any good, and that includes myself. Gathering all the facts and educating does, though. My anger still is here for what happened to that little girl. My sympathy for her family, and may justice prevail. The second tweet read, I'm so damn tired of seeing black people killed by police. I took the tweet down because it's being used to create more hate. This isn't about one officer. It's about the entire system, and they always use our words to create more racism. I'm so desperate for more accountability. Accountability was in all caps. Does, did, this, did this solve anything from the first tweet, Sap, did, or did it just create more of an issue? It probably created more of an issue. Again, the same people are going to say, LeBron was not threatening with that very, very first tweet. If you despise LeBron James, and again, there's plenty of people in this country that do, uh, whether it be as a basketball player or as a social justice reformer, then you're going to look at it and say, LeBron's threatening the entire police force of Columbus, if not every cop in America, which is ludicrous. I think he should have maybe even put something out on video. I mean, he has the wherewithal, the technology. I mean, he's got production companies. Maybe he needed to not just send something out on Twitter um, in terms of, of writing it, but maybe posting some sort of video. Uh, look, this is a guy that people respect. I mean, some people don't like him as a basketball player because, you know, he's on the precipice of maybe surpassing Michael Jordan as the greatest player ever. I think he's already done that. But there's a lot of blowback to that as well. You know, anybody my age says, oh, no, he could have never played in the 80s and Bird was better and Magic was better and all this crap. So there's that pushback from middle-aged to older guys, but I think they still respect him. So I think maybe something on video, because when you see someone and you hear their words, I think it's more powerful than the written word. 
because the written word will leave more to interpretation than what comes out of your mouth, especially and what you see in your eyes, especially a tweet. I mean, that that stuff. Look, we had a president for four years that would put stuff out there and go, what exactly is he saying? What is he what is he getting at? And then he would say, I was just kidding. I mean, you, you can't use Kofifi. Yeah, you can. You, <laughs> satire does not work on Twitter. It just doesn't. There's only no, doesn't. 280 characters. I would have liked to see maybe LeBron post a video yeah, because this is how important this guy is. He is He's the most important athlete in this country. I don't even know who's second when it comes to this. It's probably Colin Kaepernick, who doesn't speak, you know, yeah. but who, who's anywhere near as big as LeBron when it comes to this. I think Kyrie Irving fancies himself as someone, but he doesn't have the, the juice or the cachet of LeBron. So I would have preferred a video rather than a written tweet. I think that would have been more powerful. I think it's hard to, you know, in the situation that LeBron's in and that really every black person's in in this country is that they're finding it difficult and justifiably so to be able to look at these things now with any nuance, mm-hmm. which which sure. I understand. I, I, I think that that is an extremely difficult task to ask yep. somebody who is who are now don't trust the police at all, who are frankly afraid of the police anytime that they get pulled over. Uh, and, and so anytime that they see, uh, you know, uh, a white officer kill a black person, whether it be uh, adult, teenager, kid, male, female, uh, doesn't matter, um, that it, it's hard to look at any of these cases because it's happened so frequently throughout their lifetimes. It's hard for them to say, well, this case, we can look at this case uh, different than this one. And mm-hmm. it, it's just something that I think you and I, Sap, can't can't really imagine so we, no. we can sit here and say yeah the proper thing to do is to look at them in shades of gray and say that you know this one is slightly different than that and that the intent behind what Derek Chauvin is different than the intent behind what Nicholas Reardon did but at some point when you see it happen so often in your community and you feel the pain of that I, I think it becomes virtually impossible to be able to do that so while I, I don't think LeBron did anybody any good, including himself or his community by sending out these tweets. I, I I don't really know if he was going to react to it. I don't know how else he would react to it because uh, there's just so much pain there and anger. I'm asking him, I think a lot of people are asking him to do something that they, that he's not capable of, not because he doesn't lack the cognitive ability, but because I think they're just so a lot of black people, most black people are so drained at this point mm-hmm. by it. Uh, so- Absolutely. Make so many good points there, Jeff, because how can we possibly understand what LeBron James is going through? And then people will throw out, well, he's worth $800 million. That doesn't mean anything because if he's pulled over by an officer and something happens, all the money in the world can't rectify that wrong. Bro, so- we just saw a, a uniformed officer get uh, pepper sprayed in, in mm-hmm. what was it, in Virginia sap? That mm-hmm. this, you know, he was in full military regalia and right. it didn't, it, yep. but did, he happened did, to be black and it didn't stop the police officers. Didn't mean a thing. Yeah. Nope. Full, full military uh, outfit. Yeah. That was, that was so sickening. It was, it was again, nauseating. So no, that's a great point, Jeff, because we can sit here, you know, in our homes and, and bloviate for as long as we want about, well, this is how it should have been done. And here's what he should have done or could have done and didn't do. It's a lot easier from here. Uh, in the end, there's still another young black girl who was killed. Now, if you want to get into nuance, you know, if the officer doesn't do anything, maybe that particular girl kills another girl and it becomes some sort of, you know, tragedy, uh, even bigger than it was. So uh, it, it is very difficult. I like when athletes speak out. Uh, but again, I think, you know, at some point you, you have to maybe just rein it in a little bit because you could do some damage. Um but let's not forget that most of the people that had a problem with this tweet are going to have a problem no matter what. He has the usual suspects. It wasn't the eating. usual suspects. There's no way. Nobody loved gonna... him more, or hated him more after this. It was right. already, and the lines were drawn. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's the way it was with, when Trump was president. When we got to 2020, I'm like, the people that like him, who voted for him in 2016, are going to vote for him again. The people that were turned off by him are going to vote against him again. And there's a very, very small swath that may change their mind, but not necessarily. It's just a matter of, which side gets more voters out? Well, the same thing here. Like someone who's a huge LeBron fan isn't going to turn around the day after and go, you know what? I'm done with that guy. He's just too much for me. Or there's not going to be some other guy who goes, I 
despise him and the next day go, wow, I really now respect him. You're not changing people's opinions. And I think he's, he's comfortable in that situation, right? I mean, I don't think many athletes would be comfortable in that situation. He can carry a lot of weight on those broad shoulders. A lot of athletes would crumble in that situation. He's been under the microscope for close to 20 years now. As a, as a junior in high school, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, being an only child with a single parent, uh, you know, going to come in and save the NBA, right? Because he came in the year after Michael Jordan retired. He was going to save the NBA. He was going to save a franchise in Cleveland and all of that. And I think he's handled himself quite well. But uh, I would have preferred a video. But again, you make a great point, Jed. How do I know what LeBron's going through in that moment? I don't think either one of us are qualified to say. Yeah, I don't look at this as the same thing as, you know, when he, he made those comments about China and, you know, Daryl Morey and stuff, because I think, you know, the intent behind that was protecting his own interests and, and money. I mean, this is there's a lot bigger things at stake here with uh, yes. with the police and, and relationship to the black community in this country. And one final note, Jeff, when it comes to that. And, and again, I wish he would have spoken out against China because I think China um, is an enemy of ours. and you know, their record on human rights is horrible. I don't even know if that's a strong enough word, but that is another country. Like, right. I, I prefer when we kind of like uh, analyze our own country rather than analyzing other countries. Yeah, it is Not funny that to support that, that. The America first people are the ones who get upset when, Le- when right. LeBron doesn't mention China. But it doesn't, yeah. all this is, that's why I don't want to talk politics for that long on the show, because it's nonsensical. You can never no. win, you can never lose. There's just, it just goes round and round in a circle. And it's, I mean, yep. somebody has an argument for everything. But, it, you know, it, it, this, this was an important enough story. Like we said, LeBron is the biggest basketball star on the planet. He's one of the biggest uh, names on the planet. And this was a, a story that uh, captured the attention of, virtually everybody in this country and people yep. around the world. So, uh, you know, LeBron's reaction to it and the subsequent events and the shooting, um, you know, that it, it would, it would be foolish of us and, un, and un inconsistent of our mission to talk about the NBA, to not talk about it. Absolutely. He's, you know what, as I said, he's a lightning rod, unlike any other athlete in this country. And it's not even close. I mean, Tom Brady, um, is phenomenal. He's the greatest quarterback, the greatest football player ever. His tweets happen to be more about he's complaining about the number changes in the NFL. He doesn't really weigh into any social issues. LeBron goes to where, you know, the fire is very, very hot. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, Tom Brady's a psycho. I'm pretty sure his programming only allows him to be focused <laughs> on football that when they put him in the and made him in the laboratory. Um, <laughs> We'll we'll move on now, but that was we needed to talk about it. Uh, again, it would if we pretended it didn't happen, then we're not really an NBA podcast. We're just pretending that we are. So no. we'll, we'll move on to a, a, a more um, a more direct storyline uh, as a game I was really interested in. I was watching on the periphery yesterday because I was watching the uh, the Celtics and the Suns more more closely. Uh, but the biggest game of the night was the. Uh, the Bucks Sixers potential Eastern Conference Finals uh, preview, and I think to the surprise of a lot of people, Giannis completely outdueled Joel Embiid in that game, and the Bucks got the win. The Bucks winning at home not so much a surprise as Giannis outplaying Embiid, who Embiid basically has outplayed everybody that he's he's gone one on one with this year. But uh, Giannis showed why he's the two time reigning MVP right here, Sap. And so the Bucks won that game one twenty four to one seventeen. Giannis finished with 27 points, six assists, 16 rebounds, two steals, a block, and was 8 of 15 from the floor. Joel Embiid finished with 24 points, three assists, just three rebounds, a block, and he was 9 of 21 from the floor, 0 of 4 from 3. Can we read anything into this game? Yeah, Joel Embiid struggles in back-to-back games. Okay. Back-to-back <laughs> nights. I mean, right. He played- doesn't have to worry about that in the playoffs. Shouldn't have to worry about that in the playoffs. It's no different than Kemba Walker had his best game. Why? Because there was a gap between the game before that and the game that he had his best game, right? The Celtics well, they don't on even play him night. in back-to-backs, yeah. Yeah, but he got an extra day's rest because the oh, Celtics that's true. That's lost to Chicago on Monday, and then they beat Phoenix on Thursday. They've been playing every other day and sometimes back-to-back days. Well, he had a, an extra day off, and he looked like Kemba Walker, the all-star from Charlotte. I think Embiid struggles when he's playing – back-to-back nights because again he's a large man who's had issues with his back his knees 
Uh, I think the back-to-back games impact two types of players. They impact the, the big guys because there's just a lot of movement going on there with a lot of weight. But I think they also impact the smaller guys because they have to recover. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of physicality uh, involved in, in just playing at Kemba Walker size at five foot 11, barely six feet. So I think that that really was the telltale sign that Embiid back to back nights struggles. And um, look, you're, you've been on Milwaukee for the last month, two months saying, you know, keep an eye on them, that this might be the year that no one's paying attention to them. They're not going to end up with the best record in the East, but they may be better during playoff time uh, because of Drew Holiday. You know, yeah, this is the, the best roster in the offseason. Best, the best chance they have to advance. Yeah. Giannis has had. Yeah. Without question. And I mean, Middleton, Middleton now you could say is their third guy. If you want to put Drew Holiday as their number two guy. And Giannis, there's going to be less pressure on him this time because he's not going to win the MVP, even though his numbers are the same as they've been the last two years when he won the MVP. Right. And they won't have the best record in the league. They won't have the best record in the league. No one's expecting them to go. And, you know, this happens a lot in in all sports where you're, you know, sometimes in football, you're the third or fourth seed and you, you sneak in and you get hot and you get to the Super Bowl. I think the Ravens, uh, one year with a six seed and ended up going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, the wild card, people yeah. weren't expect weren't expecting it. So uh, this could be the case with Milwaukee. Uh, they're all kind of jockeying for that top spot. You know, Philly looked like they were starting to gain control. Then they lost back to back games against Phoenix and Milwaukee. Brooklyn, uh, who knows what Brooklyn's doing because you just don't know who's going to play on a given night. So uh, yeah, Milwaukee. That's an impressive win, even though it's at home. Philadelphia does play much better at home than they do on the road. Uh, that could be a second round matchup, which I think would be a seven game series. And- well, I guess the question is for for Philly is, you know, that's a dominant stat line from from Giannis. I mean, he can yep. probably put up even more points, but 16 rebounds. They filled it up. I mean, and they shot very efficiently, eight of 15 from the floor. So what does what does Philly do to defend Giannis? Well, Simmons didn't play last night, correct? Uh, I'll look into that box score. I'm Check into that. I sure. don't think Simmons played. So that's a big factor. Simmons is probably the leading contender to be defensive player of the year. That's a big player to miss in that game. If I'm, if I'm correct, I believe he did not play. Uh, there's been some sort of load management going on with Ben Simmons, uh, like every player in the league, with the exception of Nikola Jokic, who's played every game. That's why he's going to be the MVP. But if Simmons isn't out there, you know, he's a good matchup. He did matchup. not play. Yeah, that's, that's a good matchup. If, if anybody can combat Giannis, it's more Simmons than Embiid. Embiid isn't nimble enough to deal with Giannis. Giannis, to me, is You don't like want a him giant... to work that much on defense, right? No. I mean, it, he's, he's 285 pounds, probably Embiid. He actually looks better than he's looked at any point in his NBA career. I look at Giannis at this point, who's really filled out from his rookie year. Giannis at times looks like a big version of Russell Westbrook, right? Like a guy with boundless energy who I don't necessarily – think he knows what he's doing all the time but he's such a great athlete and he plays his ass off every possession that he's just so good so I think Simmons you need him back to combat Giannis I think Philly would beat Milwaukee in a series provided both sides are healthy because I think Philly does have the three-point shooters now in Seth Curry and Danny Green and look Danny Green's one of those guys that just keeps playing in the finals and winning championships so uh, I think they're still better than Milwaukee but you need Simmons healthy and I'm sure he will be for the postseason I think Milwaukee actually poses a tougher matchup for Philly than Brooklyn, and this is why. Because they have bodies to throw at Embiid. They have Giannis, Mm -hmm. they have Lopez, they have P.J. Tucker now, they have Bobby Portis. So that's four big bodies that they can just keep throwing, and that's a lot of fouls also that you can just keep throwing at Embiid. We know... Brooklyn's MO is out. You got out. They have to outscore you. They're not going to play defense. It's just not going to happen. They're not capable of it. Uh, And they very well may outscore everybody and win the championship. I kind of have that inkling, but I could be wrong. But I I do like this makeup of this Milwaukee team. I'd like it better if they had a true number two and not Drew Holiday. Uh, But I, I just, I think that being under the radar is much better for them instead of having all this pressure on them. So, I, I look into that game as, yeah, Ben Simmons is pretty obviously the second best player on, on Philadelphia. He's one of, if not the best defensive player in the league. But I, I just like the way Milwaukee's roster matches up with the Sixers roster. And I like the way that Milwaukee's heading into the postseason. I, I, I think that Philly honestly would maybe rather play Brooklyn because Brooklyn, I mean, Embiid will average 40 points a game in that series. They have no one to stop him. Now, 
obviously the number one seed is important because in a second round matchup, you're playing Miami, the Celtics, the Knicks, whoever. Yeah, you avoid that other team. The There's seed. three teams right. in the East. Right, except the Knicks are going to be a pain in the ass to play. I mean, you know, you, they'll, you'll they'll, beat them. They'll go down. Mm-hmm. They'll go down in five games, but they'll they'll really, really test you. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the Clippers a couple of years ago when they took Golden State to six games in the first round. It was a, a scary series for Golden State because it went six games, and then I believe the Clippers won a couple of games at Oracle. Uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of Brooklyn a couple of years ago when they built a team with a very strong culture and they were a pain mm-hmm. in the ass in the postseason. The Knicks are going to do that. I mean, the Celtics have more talent than the Knicks, but the Knicks may be a tougher out because they've all bought into whatever Tom Thibodeau was selling. And Julius Randle's playing at a – They're the hottest NBA team in the level. NBA right now. I mean, the last game they lost was the Celtics and, and back uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, But if you're the one seed in the East – you avoid having to beat both Milwaukee and Philadelphia or Brooklyn, whatever the combinations right. are. So that's going to be very important to see. But it doesn't look like any of those teams is making it a priority. Certainly Brooklyn, you know, Hyden's going to be out dealing with the hamstring, if that's what the case is, unless they just want to have load management. Durant is in and out of the lineup, and can you really count on Kyrie? So He comes and goes like as he pleases. <laughs> he's He's got his own – he's like a – a great jazz musician who, you know, he's not appearing tonight. He doesn't feel like playing. Uh, so I don't know if it's a priority. I mean, if Simmons is out with something, but nothing too serious. I think it's dangerous for these teams. This is what, this is what bothers me because I do want to value the regular season. So, you know, if everybody's just being so cavalier, not Cleveland, but just so cavalier <laughs> about who cares about the regular season I kind of hope it bites someone in the ass. Hopefully not the Lakers. It would be Brooklyn the, if it's right. It would be I mean, Brooklyn and it bites in the ass. Yeah, because I mean, they played what, nine games together? together? Seven. They played seven, seven games Jesus. yet. A hundred, 186 minutes. You know, actually, James, James Harden played more games in Houston than he played in Brooklyn with Durant and Kyrie. That's, Again, that's this is why the league doesn't been. want them to win. This no. is not the way they want things to go. Now, the Lakers thing is a little bit different because AD – has had a history of injuries. So I think that was real. Uh, LeBron, okay, maybe he's milking it, but I don't know if he's going to try to milk something when he's chasing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the all-time They've leading also won in the before. league. They won last and year. They, they won last year, right. So they and, – and look, those two guys, I think, can come back quickly and it's going to work because it's already worked for them. Uh, if Brooklyn is the team that you look at and go, man, if they win, this is going to set a bad precedent in this league that, you know, take the regular season off and, and see what happens in the postseason – the league, what makes the NFL king is the regular season is so damn important. I can't wait till May 12th when they release the NFL schedule, right? We're going to see, okay, Tampa's yeah. coming to Foxborough and whenever. And do the Mike Francesa. Days. Win, loss, uh, yeah. win. Yeah. Uh, terrible. <laughs> but I think that, you know, like I'm looking forward to Green Bay, Kansas City. They're going to play this year again, Mahomes against Rodgers. So we look forward to the regular season. With basketball, it's like, Oh, yeah, what's the Christmas Day games? Those ought to be fun to watch. I mean, here's a sport that we both love, but normally starts its regular season, what, the middle of October? But they kind of say that the season really gets underway Christmas Day right. like 10 weeks later. I mean, that's that'd be like saying the NFL season starts the week after Labor Day, but it really doesn't start till Halloween. Like, what? Yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. Uh <laughs> I, I again, this is why I'm really rooting against Brooklyn. I, it's just it sets such a bad precedent. But I think we we feel pretty confident that there should be two tremendous series in the East. However, it shakes yes. out uh, the semi the semifinals and the final one of the semifinals matchups, mm-hmm. and then the the finals should be really really good competitive matchups. Uh, the the reason that again, I think as far as the Sixers go, if they're playing Brooklyn. They don't typically lose when Embiid goes bananas statistically. Mm-hmm. And I just don't see how on earth Brooklyn could even potentially bother Embiid. No, he'd get 40 and 15 every game, right? And I think Simmons, healthy, locked in, focused, whatever you want to say, can maybe get in the way of Harden being as effective as he normally is. Now, Durant, to me, is uncoverable. Um, you know, and, and they can throw some people at Kyrie again, Kyrie's uncoverable, but at least if you make those guys inefficient and have to work their asses off to score, that's considered a win. You're not going to shut those guys down, but I think Philadelphia certainly would beat Brooklyn. Milwaukee could beat Brooklyn as well. I, I that's going to be a fun 
you know, you could almost have a three team tournament there, like a round robin. Yeah, round robin. Teams. That's what, yeah, they, because like they, I said, they, Philly matches up better with Brooklyn right. than Milwaukee does, but Milwaukee matches up better with Philly than Brooklyn right. does. So it's interesting. It, 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 each team is very different than the other one. Yep, absolutely. It's going to be interesting. Out west, it's a little bit different because the conference is deeper. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you may run into a hot Golden State team or a hot Dallas team and they're coming through the play in tournament. And now you got to deal with Steph or Luca. Right. No one really knows what to make of Utah or Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah. Denver. Look, if anyone thinks uh, anybody but Jokic is the MVP, I would like to speak to them because now they're 4 0. It's getting ridiculous. No. He's great. He's probably going to finish top five, but the team's a 500 team. Now they're marginally better with him than without him. Jokic has played every game this year. They're four and zero since Murray went down. They had an eight game winning streak with Murray missing most of those games. Like I, I, to me, it's not even a debate. Uh, Embiid should finish second, but he's missed eighteen games. That's going to be a quarter of the season. LeBron has missed more. Uh, Anthony yeah, was, Davis has missed even more. It's, it to me, it's 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 almost laughable. It's Jokic. Now I think it was the night sap that. Uh... Curry had like I think it was the last game of or second to last game of his incredible streak of thirty games. He had like forty nine, and was just and I think they beat the Sixers. Yes, uh, and people are like, oh yeah, he's the MVP now. Meanwhile, in Denver, Jokic had a forty seven point triple double and hit a game winning three in overtime. So it's yeah, like, you know he's just playing under the radar, but like he had a better game than Curry, but people weren't no, talking he's... about it. He's the MVP of the league. I mean, unless he doesn't play the rest of the season somehow. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, we'll talk about that obviously more as it approaches. But before we, we finish the show today, Sap, I did want to finish with a, a sad story because uh, it's not just a national story, but it's a local story for us here in Boston is that uh, Terrence Clark, um, who had de- just declared for the NBA draft out of Kentucky, uh, he died in a car accident um, yesterday, Thursday afternoon. Um, in Los Angeles while preparing for the NBA draft. He was 19 years old from Dorchester, Massachusetts. Uh, You and I are very familiar with Dorchester. Uh, He went to Brewster Academy uh, before committing to Kentucky, uh, one of the elite prep schools in the country. Uh, He had just signed with Clutch Sports. Uh, In fact, his last tweet was announcing he had uh, signed at Clutch Sports. Boston, for those of you listening, and Massachusetts, for those of you listening out of state, Loves basketball, but does not produce a lot of basketball talent out of high school. Mm -hmm. Terrence Clark, for the past two years, prior to him enrolling in Kentucky, was talked about a lot in the city because he was sort of like the great hope of restoring elite-level basketball prospects to Boston. And he talked about that a lot, saying he wanted to put Boston back on the map in terms of prospects. And was a consensus five-star recruit McDonald's all American struggled with injuries at Kentucky, but was certainly going to be drafted. And this is just, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible for his family and his friends, for him, for the city of Boston. You felt like just an emotional outpouring because he was a kid who grew up, you know, look at his pictures. He's in front of Fenway park. He's at Celtics Mm -hmm. games. He also was, exceptionally close with a lot of these guys in the Celtics who couldn't even talk about it post post game yesterday. Cause they were just distraught. It seemed from all accounts. I never met him like a tremendous kid mm-hmm. uh, with the world ahead of him and an NBA career ahead of him. And it just came to an end in a, in a car accident. Yeah. Kemba Walker, a 10, 11 year veteran was in tears. Brad Stevens uh, says it's very difficult to talk about basketball after finding out what happened. Uh, I know Chad Finn of the Globe had tweeted out something that I think is is pretty interesting. The NBA should add a 61st pick in the draft and have the Celtics draft him. Yeah, um, they've done that which before. I, yeah, that'd be really a cool moment. Yeah, just do it, um, and and I think it would it would give his family um, try to fill the hole in that heart that exists now. Life is so precious, Jet, 19 year old guy heading to the NBA, and yeah, everybody said that this guy just was a young man who, who always had a smile on his face, was positive. Man, when I heard this, and, and I, I didn't really know much about him playing at Kentucky. I you know heard about him as um, a high school player here in the area and, and playing at Brewster Academy, and it's just so sad. It's just it's incredibly sad. And, and I think the league, which the NBA is, is usually pretty good with this stuff, will, will add one more pick to the draft and have the Celtics select him with the 61st pick in the 2021 NBA draft. 
Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's, it reminds me of, um, this was, I think in the late nineties, early two thousand was Bobby Phil's was in mm-hmm. a car accident. Yep. Uh, and he died tragically too. That's the last time I can remember something like this happening. Um, except for Bobby Phil's had been in the NBA and this one has, you know, the, the, the last, I think Nerland's Noel was the last Boston prospect to be drafted into the NBA. Um, yeah, he was just, sixth overall, right? Doesn't New happen Orleans that Noel, often. Yeah. No, not anymore. I mean, obviously, the greatest player to come out of the state is Patrick Ewing. Cambridge right. Ridge and Latin was the first pick in 1985. Yeah, I mean, we've had, um, you know, Dana Barrows had a really nice NBA career, made it to one all-star game. Uh, yeah, you just don't see many players. You have a lot of, of great basketball basketball fans etc but it's it's not new york it's not washington uh, it seems like most of the players now are coming out of southern california or a ton are coming from texas um, yeah seattle but a lot of them seattle a lot too. yeah but it's just uh, it, what more can you say and when you saw brad stevens and kemba walker i mean these are grown men really impacted by this yeah, jalen brown it shows you yeah had about 15 pictures that he just put up on his instagram i know he was really close with jalen brown uh, yeah. I remember reading a story about him, you know, as he was getting ready to enroll in Kentucky, scrimmaging with Tatum and Brown. They just, I think the whole team took him under their wing. Cause again, it's, it's rare to have that level elite level prospect here in Boston mm-hmm. and grow up as a Celtics fan. And I think they were like, Oh, this will be really fun. You know, he's going to Kentucky. We can see what this guy's got. We can help him along the way. And I mean, it's not like Brown and Tatum are that much older than him. No, um, no. So it's just, it's, it's, it's an awful story. Uh, I can't even imagine what the parents are feeling like. And I do hope, like you said, Seth, the NBA does that, you know, 61st pick thing. And uh, just so he can get his name announced because he was going to be drafted. I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't a debate. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, thoughts and to the, to the parents and to the Celtics uh, players who were close to them and his friends. And it's just, it's terrible. I, I was really excited to see this kid play in the NBA and represent Boston. Um, and uh, now, you know, we were we were robbed of that, and it's unfair. And life is is cruel in a lot of times. And so, rest in peace to to Terrence Clark. And uh, yeah, it's all it's awful. It really is. Life is precious. And uh, again, our, our prayers um, are there for his family. Yeah, I mean, what a it's geez, it's just like the hits keep on coming. It's it's been a it's been a tough uh, tough year year and a half. Really, really, yeah, really brutal. Um, but. We move on as best we can, and we keep those people in our memories. And um, you know, you, you you try to live on for those people. And and you know, Terrence Clark wouldn't want the people to stop playing basketball on his account, and he'd want uh, you know the NBA to live on without him, and uh, his family to go on without him. And so I'm sure that's what they'll they'll do their best to do. So our our thoughts, uh, obviously, to Terrence Clark and his family uh, in this really really tough time. But uh, that is going to do it for this edition of uh, what was a heavy episode of the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. But you know what? I'm, I'm glad that we're able to do that because um, I, I do think that we pride ourselves, Sap, on being able to tackle serious stories, too. Uh, and ignoring them doesn't do anybody any good, uh, you know, whether it's something like a police shooting or it's something like a, a tragic death. It, it mm-hmm. Just pretending it didn't happen isn't, isn't helpful to anybody um and it's you know a slap in the face i think to our audience to say we're not going to talk about this when mm-hmm. i mean sometimes the things that you talk about aren't f- pleasant to talk about but oh. there's they're, they're stories regardless uh so thanks everybody for watching remember to check us out on youtube youtube.com slash jet stryer check us out on fullpresscoverage.com uh and uh on itunes wherever podcasts are found and we'll be back tomorrow with another podcast it will not be as heavy it will be very oscars centric uh sap and i are big movie fans and the oscars are this sunday so keep an eye out for that and an ear out for that and we'll be back then see everybody